Scots didn't vote for that. Yep. And that's one of the many reasons why we won't be uh, supporting uh, this deal. Freedom of movement has been something that has been vital to fill gaps in the employment market in Scotland and indeed across the United Kingdom. We've got a big crisis across the UK in how we look after our ageing population. A lot of the people who look after our ageing population at present come from elsewhere in the European Union and it would be a real shame if we discourage them from coming here in the future. But let's look... Yes, I'll give away. I'm interested by what she's saying and um, I'm somebody who agrees with her really on the students coming to the United Kingdom and should be able to work for a period uh, as part of the payback. I think that, that is important. But doesn't she accept the fact that there are many people who voted Brexit who, do, who are not saying no to immigration, it's just controlling immigration and it's that this Parliament or this, the government of this country should be the one that decides immigration levels? Well, nobody's saying that we shouldn't have an immigration policy. Of course we have to have an immigration policy. The point I'm making is that the immigration policy should be evidence-based yes. and should take account of the needs of the economy and the different yeah, regions yeah, and yeah, nations yeah, of these yeah. islands. And this government's policy does not. If this government has such a great idea about the future policy on immigration across the UK, why is it taking them so long to bring forward the white paper? And if they're so keen to throw their arms open to people from all across the world and have everyone come here on an equal basis, why does the Prime Minister, your Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of these benches opposite, persist in her ridiculous net migration target? It's just nonsense that, that the benches opposite want to throw the doors open. For so long as the Prime Minister is in place and that ridiculous migration target is in place, that simply won't be happening. I'll give way to Alan. Very grateful to my honourable learned friend for giving way. Um, isn't the reality, though, that the government will, will, will try as much to, to ramp up the rhetoric around about EU migrants, but the reality is to try and get some of their trade deals through, they're going to have to uh, bend the rules when it comes to visas for India and likes anyway. So what they're taking with one hand, they're giving the other anyway. I entirely agree with my honourable friend. It is crystal clear that countries outside the European Union, if we ever get to the stage of being able to enter into third party trade deals, and that looks pretty unlikely at the moment, but if we ever get to that stage, in return for access to their markets, they're going to want yep. access to the UK for people who want to migrate from their country here. Now, I want to just touch briefly on the position of EU citizens. Yes, I will, of course. I, I, I'm thank you, thankful for, uh, for giving way. Will she agree with me that it is the language around immigration that has been so yes, incredibly toxic? Yeah. And that like, people, people like me, I'm a European migrant, and I look around and think, do they mean me? Yeah. And that is exactly, yeah, exactly um, what yeah. other Europeans f feel as well. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I do agree with the Honourable Lady. And I think part of the reason the language has been so toxic is we haven't been talking about the reality of the situation. We've been talking about a perceived reality. And some, something that a, a Labour member, an Honourable member, I think uh, he's not in his place any longer, a point he made earlier, uh, I think, uh, which I entirely agree with, is that... Uh, the benches opposite, the government benches, by their policies, have created a great deal of poverty across the United Kingdom. Yeah. Wales and Scotland have, to an extent, been protected from that because we have had different devolved governments. I notice as I travel around provincial England that the infrastructure is not in such a good condition as it is in Scotland. The no social housing has been built here for years, in contrast we're building a lot of social housing in Scotland. I think many working class people in England have been led to believe that the cause of their woes, the fact they can't get a house, the fact they can't get a well paid job, okay they can get a job but not a properly paid job, they've been led to believe that that's the fault of the immigrants when it's the fault of this toxic conservative government. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, under the withdrawal agreement, EU citizens who are already here will not continue to enjoy the same rights that they do yep. at present. I know they'll continue to enjoy some rights, but it won't be the same rights. They'll lose their lifelong right of return. They won't have the same family reunification rights. And they'll get no protection from inadvertently becoming undocumented illegal citizens. And my goodness, Mr Speaker, the Windrush scandal yeah. has yeah. taught yeah. us yeah. Yeah. what happens to undocumented yeah. citizens, lawful citizens in this country. God help EU citizens who find themselves undocumented. Yeah. Yeah. Illegal yeah. citizens don't take my word for it, take the word of the National Audit Office and reports of various uh, committees in this House. And in order to hang on to the rights they already have, not to get a passport, 
but to get the digital identity that means they can hang on to the rights they already have, EU citizens are going to have fees imposed pay. upon them. Yeah. Now, in Scotland, the Scottish Government has said that they will pay those fees for those working in the public sector. And now it looks like there might be a bit of a tax catch in relation to that. And I'm looking forward to the Conservative Government addressing that properly and perhaps extending the same largesse as the Scottish Government has to people working in the public sector at the south of the border. I'm going to touch briefly on the security, justice and law enforcement issues because I think it's been said very clearly by others. It is simply impossible for us as a third country to have the same degree of security, justice and law cooperation as we previously had. And I think, in fairness, the Home Secretary uh, recognised that. But one of the things that's concerned those of us who represent Scottish constituencies, some of us at least, and the Scottish Government and commentators in Scotland most about this process has been the abject failure of the British Government to recognise that Scotland has a separate civil and criminal justice yep. system. Now, this isn't about devolution. This is about the Act of Union. Scotland has had a separate legal system forever and it's protected by the Act of Union. Yet our separate criminal justice system, our separate civil law system, our separate law officers have not been consulted properly no. in relation to the impact of these matters so on the Scottish legal correct. system. And of course, as we know, there's no mention whatsoever of Scotland in the withdrawal <laughs> agreement yeah. or the political yeah, uh, declaration. Uh, a lot of other much smaller uh, regions get a mention, uh, but not Scotland. And this isn't just <coughs> fanciful, uh, Mr Speaker. I know because I used to work in the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service that cooperation across Europe has made a huge difference to law enforcement in Scotland and that if we lose that, uh, we will be the worse as a result of it. But as I said, Mr Speaker, earlier, I think today is really a day for the bigger picture. And I see the bigger picture as somebody who represents a Scottish constituency and somebody of Irish parentage, I see the bigger picture of the whole Brexit process really as a tale of two unions. The union that is the United Kingdom and the union that is the European Union and the extremely stark differences as to how the members of those unions treat each other. So far as Ireland is concerned, both North and South, British politicians largely overlooked the threat that Brexit posed to the Good Friday Agreement until after the referendum. And even then, many, particularly on the benches opposite, were unable to accept and still are unable to accept the reality of the legal obligations which the United Kingdom undertook in the Good Friday Agreement. Yeah. And that old anti-Irish xenophobia, which people like my mother remember so well, has raised its head again, Absolutely. even to the extent of some on the benches opposite talking about the Irish tail wagging the British dog and other such insulting yeah. metaphors. Yeah. Yeah. But because the EU27 got behind the Irish government's legitimate concerns, they became central to the Brexit process. Politicians on the benches opposite, not all of them, but some of them, and indeed a few behind me, waited in vain for the EU27 to crack and throw Ireland under the bus. It didn't happen, and it's not going to happen. I was at an event recently where the very distinguished professor of modern history at UCD Mary Daly remarked that the current situation in this House has very uncanny echoes of what happened here a hundred years ago when the electric <coughs> politics of Ulster determined what happened at Westminster. And it's really quite ironic that that should be so, Mr Speaker, as we're shortly to celebrate the hundredth anniversary of the election of the first female MP to this Parliament, who was, of course, a distinguished Irish nationalist, the yeah, Countess yeah. Markovich, who went on to be the first woman uh, cabinet minister in <laughs> Western uh, Europe. But the truth is, the problems that arose as a result of partition have come back to haunt this House mm -hmm. yeah. as a result of the Brexit process. I think something that unites us all is we want to see peace uh, kept yeah. in, the, in Northern Ireland. Yes, I will give way to the Honourable Gentleman. Would she accept that the Irish, the Republic of Ireland, actually has been thrown under the bus and don't even realise that the wheels are running over them at present? Because if this agreement goes through, a border down the Irish Sea will not only affect Northern Ireland, but the Republic of Ireland, whose main market is GB, who takes its goods across the, the uh, GB as a land bridge and will find checks not just at Holyhead, but at Dover. Well, no, I don't accept that, and I speak regularly with politicians from all parties in the Republic of Ireland, and certainly that's not how they <laughs> see matters. And in fact, politicians and indeed business and the wider community in the Republic of Ireland are broadly very, very happy with the way that the European Union has dealt with this. 
And of course, Mr. Speaker, it's sometimes conveniently forgot in this House that Northern Ireland uh, voted to remain uh -huh. in the yeah. European yeah. Union. Yeah. And that's partly because during this time, the no Northern Ireland hasn't, been, hasn't had the democratic voice of its Assembly. So it's only uh, the voices of the Honourable Gentleman that has been heard in relation to Northern <coughs> Ireland. And of course, the Honourable Gentleman's party, the DUP, do not represent the majority of people in Northern Ireland who voted to remain. And the Prime Minister has refused to meet with the Greens, the SDLP, Sinn Féin or the Alliance, which I think is really quite disgraceful. Anyway, Mr Speaker, meanwhile in Scotland, Scotland voted to remain in the EU, in the EU by an even more substantial margin than Northern Ireland, 62%. And polls show if a vote was held tomorrow, it would be nearer 70 per cent. Despite that, the Scottish Government's concerns, and it's a democratically elected government, I know benches opposite like to call it the SNP government and pretend it doesn't have any legitimacy, but it was elected democratically. Its concerns, often supported by other parties in the Scottish Parliament, as it will be today, when Liberal Democrats, Greens and Labour will vote with the SNP in trying to protect Scotland from the consequences of Brexit, the legitimate concerns of the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament uh, have been wholly ignored, and we can really only look with envy whilst the concerns of the Irish Government have been centre stage in Brussels. And unlike Northern Ireland, Mr Speaker, Scotland has actually had a strong and functioning Government and Parliament during this process, well able to express its views, but that hasn't protected us. And so this Brexit process has highlighted the limits of devolved as opposed to independent government. Yeah, yes, I, give I, I thank Honourable Friends for giving way. And she's absolutely right. We fully expect the Scottish Parliament this evening to endorse a cross-party motion rejecting the withdrawal agreement, just as uh, the Welsh uh, Assembly did yeah. last night. The Scottish Conservatives are describing that debate as needless. Scotland doesn't need to talk about Brexit, Westminster, the big parliament will make that decision for you, know your place. Yeah. That's, that exemplifies how they want to undermine devolution and use yeah, Brexit yeah. to do so. Of course, the Scottish Conservatives don't represent the majority of Scottish opinion in relation to anything, let alone Brexit. It's often forgotten, after all, the hullabaloo about the seats they won last year, that they are still very much in the minority in Scottish politics and very much in the minority in, Scot in the Scottish Parliament. Yeah, yeah. But let's just look at what has happened in relation to Scotland over the last two years. Years. The UK Government cut the Scottish Government out of the Brexit negotiations completely. The Scottish Government put forward a differentiated deal, the idea of a differentiated deal or the idea of a compromise for the whole of the United Kingdom at an early stage. That was completely ignored. The Scottish Parliament voted, again with cross-party support, everyone apart from the Tories and one Lib Dem, voted to withhold consent to the EU withdrawal bill. That was ignored. When the Scottish Parliament tried to pass its own legal continuity bill, it was challenged in the UK Supreme Court, and we're still waiting for that decision, challenged by the British Government. <coughs> and when amendments came back from the House of Lords to the floor of this House in relation to the withdrawal bill, Scottish MPs got 19 minutes to debate the implications of those amendments, and the full time was taken up by the Government Minister. Scotland isn't mentioned in the withdrawal agreement or the political declaration, and whilst Little Gibraltar, important as it is, was afforded advance sight of the agreement. The Scottish Government only saw it when the rest of us did. Yeah. Yeah. So what the point I'm making, Mr Spectre. Speaker, is Scotland's marginalisation and its very weak bargaining position within the union that is the United Kingdom has been very exposed by Brexit. Yeah. After our failure in the independence referendum of 2014, 56 Scottish National Party MPs were elected to this House, yet not one of our amendments to the Scotland Bill at that time got passed, despite the fact we had 56 out of the 59 seats in Scotland and 50 per cent of the vote at that time. Not one. But yet we were told this wonderful Scotland Act was going to give us huge amounts of powers and we had the most powerful devolved Parliament in the world. Well, I ask any fair-minded person in this chamber or anyone watching, does the sequence of events that I've just described really sound like the most powerful devolved yeah, parliament in the world yeah, to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course it doesn't, because devolution's constitutional fragility has been revealed in Westminster's assertion of control and the attempt to repatriate powers here from Brussels, and also the disregard shown for Scotland's preferences in the negotiations yeah, with yeah. Brussels. So, Mr Speaker, the Brexit process has told Scottish voters a lot about the reality of devolution and that power devolved is indeed power retained. 
and that the United Kingdom is not the union of equals we were told it was before 2014, but a unitary state where devolved power is retrieved to the centre when convenient, and no one but the Conservative Party, who only represent a minority of voters in Scotland, get a say on major decisions over trade and foreign uh, policy. So, Mr Speaker, the experience of Ireland and Scotland during the Brexit process show us there is a very significant contrast between the way that the nations who are member states of the European Union are treated and the nations who are members of this union are treated. And I heard the very distinguished former Taoiseach of the Republic of Ireland, John Bruton, speak recently, and he was asked about this, not by me, but by somebody else in the audience. And he said Scotland's marginalisation within the United Kingdom wouldn't happen in the European Union. If the European Union was taking a decision as drastic as Brexit, and it only had four nations in it, then all four nations would have needed to have agreed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But in the UK, it doesn't matter what Scotland and Northern Ireland say. They can always be overridden by the English vote. And that is not an anti-English comment. It is a comment on the Constitution of the United Kingdom. If Scotland was a member state in the EU, albeit a country of only 5.5 million, we would have, just like Ireland, the same veto over such a major decision in the same way that, that the big countries have. Now, Mr Speaker, there is still a little bit of hope for Scotland. And it comes from the cross-party working that we've seen in Scotland, both in the Scottish Parliament today and in the group of politicians of which I'm proud to have been a member who took the case to the Court of Justice of the European Union, where we found out yesterday the Advocate General says Article 50 can be uh, unilaterally uh, revoked. And I was interested to hear the Prime Minister, in response to my question earlier today, acknowledge that it's highly likely that the Grand Chamber of the Court will follow the Advocate General's opinion. So it seems that Scotland and Scottish politicians and the Scottish courts uh, are throwing this Parliament a lifeline to get out of the madness of Brexit. But even if we do throw that lifeline, and even if the United Kingdom Parliament takes it, and even if there is a second referendum, and even if the whole of the UK is smart enough in possession of the full facts to vote to remain part of the European Union, don't think that will be the Scottish question closed. Because the Brexit process has wholly revealed our inferior yes, status yes. within yep. this union, and people will not forget that. Exactly. Now, Mr. Speaker, I'm just coming uh, to uh, a conclusion. The last two years uh, have shown us that the Leave vote was won across the United Kingdom on the back of promises that have proved undeliverable. Now, many people say that those promises were lies, but whether they were lies or not, what we do know is that they've proved undeliverable. Now, it's hard for me to be fair to the Prime Minister because of the scorn she has shown for Scottish democracy, but I'm going to try to be fair to her and I'm going to say this. I don't think this is a bad deal because the Prime Minister is a bad negotiator. The truth is, there is no better deal than the one the United Kingdom yeah. currently yeah. enjoys yeah. within the European yeah. Union. Yeah. The Prime Minister at least tried to negotiate a deal. Others who led the Leave movement have totally and utterly abdicated their responsibility. And I watched with interest yesterday while the Right Honourable Member for Uxbridge and South Ryslip attempted or struggled to explain what it is that he wants. I was none the wiser by the end of his speech. And let's not forget his partner in crime in the Leave movement, who has left his place on the Treasury bench now. Um, but the, uh, the member for... Um, Sorry, Heath. Yes. Um, why didn't he take the job of Brexit Secretary when it was offered to him a few couple of weeks ago? Why, if you desire something so much, why not take the responsibility of delivering it? I think we all know the answer to that question. And then, of course, is the Right Honourable Member for Halton Price and Howden. His insouciant appearances at the Brexit Select Committee were really highly entertaining, but also deeply shocking. And now, where is he? I don't see him in much in the chamber in the last few days, but he's certainly not proposing any firm alternative uh, to this deal. So, Mr. Speaker, the Court of Justice of the European Union, the much maligned Court of Justice of the European Union, with the assistance of Scottish parliamentarians and the Scottish courts, has opened up new vistas of possibility for this chamber. There is a chance of reversing the madness, but I accept that there will need to be a second vote. In order to do that, we'll have to work cross-party in this chamber. There's a lot of that going on already. But 
may I respectfully suggest that parliamentarians in this chamber look north to what's happening in Edinburgh this afternoon and see that it's possible. It's possible at least for the SNP, the Labour Party, the Lib Dems and the Greens to work together. And we know from this House that it's also possible for the parties I've just mentioned to work together with some members on the benches opposite. But I want to make something crystal clear, Mr Speaker. Make no mistake, if there is a second vote across the UK, and if England, in possession of the full facts and the reality of Brexit, votes again to leave, and I'm quite sure Scotland will vote to remain, then Scotland won't stand for that, and there will have to be a second independence referendum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this time, we know, this time we know that we will have a far more sympathetic ear in Europe than we had before. Why, even the Spanish, supposedly Scotland's great enemies, their foreign minister said recently that if Scotland secedes from the UK constitutionally, he will not veto Scotland's yeah, yeah, yeah. membership of the European yeah. Union. And as I said yesterday, I very much hope that when an independent Scotland comes to try and seek membership of the European Union, it will be remembered that it was Scottish parliamentarians in the Scottish courts who attempted to give the UK Parliament an escape route from Brexit. But even if the United Kingdom does take that lifeline and that escape route, I think it's quite clear that this Brexit process has shown that the United Kingdom in its present form is not a union in which Scotland can continue to function properly. We have seen, no, I'm coming to my end, we've seen written large during this process the difference between what it means to be a member of the United Kingdom and a member of the European Union. In the European Union, even small countries like Ireland are equal partners with big countries like Germany and France. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the United Kingdom, a small country like Scotland is not an equal partner with England. The power devolved is the power retained, and Scottish democracy is always at the whim of the majority in this House. It's not tolerable, Mr Speaker, and despite what happens with Brexit, which I very much hope is reversed for the whole of the United Kingdom, I hope that the Scots will soon take the opportunity to say that Scotland's position in the UK Union is not tolerable and we want to take our, our seat at the top table in Europe, in the European Union, where I very much hope we will eventually be an equal partner with England, because I hope England stays too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.